The 72 year long struggle which won the 19th Amendment, of which this talk tells a small part, is just the first half of the most underrated story in US history. The Declaration of Independence and the US Constitution did not dif differentiate between the sexes, but from the founding, lawmakers armed with the words man and he made federal and state statutes and state constitutions discriminate against all women, limiting women's freedom and liberty. In the 1800s, women faced further restrictions and increasingly protested their inequality in a republic founded on equality. In 1865, the solely male lawmakers decided to rid themselves of the problem of women complaining. So they enshrined women's inferior status in the Constitution. As Elizabeth Cady Stanton angrily wrote, they put that word male in the 14th Amendment three times, compromising a previously non-sexist document. And cut that word out, that word male out, the Constitution is inclusive. Equally with the 15th Amendment, one additional word, sex, would have rendered the Constitution inclusive and might have avoided a history of grief. For these two amendments set the post-Civil War tone and standards for the US, which was discrimination based on the Constitution, legally effective against half the population. Susan B. Anthony prophesied in 1873, before her trial for the crime of voting as a woman, that the Reconstruction Amendments would not stop at legalized discrimination against women. Many petty freaks and cunning devices would expand it. Scotus decisions quickly made this happen, allowing Jim Crow laws poll taxes, segregation, and literacy tests. Even now, the intentional discrimination against women and the exclusion of the Reconstruction Amendments still rule. For two years, the US archivist has refused to certify and publish as the 29th Amendment, the Amendment for Equal Rights According to Sex, that the final required state ratified in 2020. So the second half of this long story is unfinished, yet few recognize today that, even today, that sex -based, the sex-based foundation of the legal and constitutional inequality in the US from 1865. Equally unrecognized is the, un equally unrecognized is the almost impossible task of changing the Constitution that the 14th and 15th Amendments bequeathed to women. Men got the right to vote and the constitutional equality through an assumption of right and through those amendments which the Republicans introduced. In 1865, Antony, fresh from her 1863 mammoth petition campaign to abolish chattel slavery, which led to the 13th Amendment, had launched a suffrage cause on July the 4th in the Tunnel, Kansas, 1865. Against fierce criticism, she called for equality for all men and all women in the right to vote. Yet because of male congressional actions during Reconstruction, women from then on had to pursue grassroots campaigning for voting rights against hysterical opposition. With more states, women's task grew both for state suffrage and for federal amendment. More inequalities across the nation ensued. In 1917, 52 years after Antony challenged male lawmakers to ensure equal rights for all under the Constitution, women were still campaigning just for the vote, and Antony's successors, the National Women's Party, arrived in Vicksburg to establish a branch. The background was the first ever picketing campaign of a president and Congress, which the MWP in Washington, D.C. had instigated that January. 
Their peaceful protests led to unwarranted jail and working workhouse time, torture, hunger strikes, and forced feeding. This was a denial of constitutional rights on top of the denial of the right to vote. With the picketing and a state suffrage victory in New York, 1917 became the pivotal year in the long struggle. In January 1918, President Wilson caved, giving his support to the federal amendment that Antony and Stanton had launched in 1868 and revived in 1878. And Mississippi contributed to this development. Southern votes in the House and Senate were essential to pass an amendment, but to pass an amendment resolution. So in May 1917, in the ladies' parlor of Vicksburg's Carroll Hotel, the NWP unfurled the Great Demand Banner calling for women's right to vote. The Great Demand Banner is on the left, and that comes from the State House in Little Rock. This is the color, the colors of the big Great Demand Banner would have been the stars rep represented the, the victory flag. The colors are gold, white, and violet, and that means give women the vote. The NWP had battled Wilson to support women's suffrage since 1913, and latterly the Democrat Control Pro Judiciary and House Rules Committee about a dedicated suffrage committee for the amendment. Gulfport's representative Harrison held a deciding vote in the Rules Committee. He was against suffrage and he was against any committee while the NWP picketed. So the arrival around May the 20th in Vicksburg of NWP national organizer Beulah Amadon and North Carolina Field Secretary Ella Sinclair Thompson was integral to the NWP national campaign. The NWP was nonpartisan with branches in 43 states, Amadon told the Vicksburg Herald. Its demand was based on the consent of the government, especially uh, consent of the governed, especially now during the war. This country is going to send men abroad to fight for the principle that those who submit to authority should have a voice in their own government. We think our country cannot go into such a war consistently until it has established this principle within our own borders. On May the 22nd, Thompson, speaking to the Colonial Dames, said, we cannot afford to have women voting in the West and not in the South and East. And this 1917 map shows the inequalities. Anything not wholly white means restricted or no female voting, traceable to the 14th and 15th Amendments. The next day, Wilson announced support for the Federal Amendment in return for the War Service. Amadou was pleased, even though when Wilson offered suffrage as a reward, he, and not as a bride, he was arrogating to himself the authority to do what the Constitution should have been doing in the first place. And it wasn't his business to be doing it either. Unfortunately, with Democrats in power, suffrage victory depended on the president converting them from anti to pro. Meanwhile, Thompson met Gulfport women in the sun parlor of the Great Southern Hotel where the whole local suffrage league joined the NWP. In Jackson, she recruited Lily Wilkinson Thompson, president of the Jackson Equality League. This high-profile victory threatened Mississippi's National American Women's Suffrage Association affiliated women. And Wilson's announcement of his support for suffrage put the cat among the pigeons. He wanted the picketing stopped, but his support upended the NASA's decades-old state suffrage policy. Nevertheless, NASA President Carrie Chapman Catt cozied up to him it helped that the two million strong NASA had already focused on war work. She believed that the NWP's picketing threatened advances with Wilson and suffrage itself. On May the 24th, therefore, in an open letter to Alice Paul, leader of the NWP, she declared that the picketing is hurting our cause. It is an unwarranted discourtesy to the president 
it gives Harrison an excuse to deny support for the House Suffrage Committee. Pratt's letter follows so closely on Wilson's announcement, and both occur so early in the Mississippi work. They both point to a co coordinated attack on Mississippi women. In June, Cat would collude with Wilson to keep news of the picketing and arrests out of the press. And censorship, in other words. A cat was indeed among the pages. Again with impeccable timing and keeping up the pressure, a possible cat ally, former Vicksburg resident Rosalie E. Lavins, wrote home. Her letter appearing on May the 29th in the Evening Post complained of the suffragists invading her beloved native state. Votes for women would be of no use during a war, she wrote, besides insulting the president, picketing was unladylike. Amidon's long reply in the post said that for the NWP, winning the vote was war work. It was fighting for liberty at home. So this is the background to the Vicksburg Convention of June 1st, 1917. That morning, the Jackson Daily News took up the cudgel of Cat's talking point. Pickets were damaging the cause greatly. They did it only to nag the president. Worse, the NWP had expanded their bulldozing tactics by establishing a personal picket for Harrison solely for the purpose of annoying him. Praising the Nassau women's reasonableness, the news warned that Mississippi women should not touch the NWP with a barge pole. Despite this pressure, 75 attended the NWP convention at the Carroll Hotel where participants passed resolutions for votes for women and one for telegrams to Congress and Harrison to urge them to get a move on. And that photograph there is what it looks like where the Carroll Hotel used to be. Um, it's a pity they can't even mark it with a sign that something important happened there. The Vicksburg meeting appeared successful, but Thompson was soon in Jackson to confer with the Jackson Committee on plans for the state. Reports of the NWP branch committee members conflict, giving the impression of something happening behind the scenes. It appears that Mrs. Daisy McLaurin Stevens of Brandon became chair, Mrs. W. H. Waddle of Jackson secretary, Mrs. Bowman Sterling of Jackson treasurer, and Mrs. R. Crump of Nita Yuma, and she's, she's on the left here. I don't know who the other lady is and Mrs. Julius Chrysler of Jackson became National Advisory Council members. Thompson's Jackson visit attracted the Jackson Daily News big guns again. Headlining Katz injuring the cause narrative, it quoted Harrison calling the picketing an outrage condemned by the earnest, fair-minded suffragists who have waged a steady, persistent and inoffensive campaign for the recognition of their rights. The editorial angrily opined that the NWP should pack up and leave Mississippi forthwith. A letter from Greenwood's Mrs. Helen McClurg of the Mississippi Women Associ Suffrage Association appeared in June the 12th, repeating Kat's narrative and distancing the MWSA colleagues of NASA from the NWP. But even before her letter appeared, the onslaught had won scalps. On June, the 8th, on June the 9th, Thompson, now in New Orleans, wrote to Crump of Nitayuma, revealing that the chairman, secretary, and treasurer for Mississippi resigned following an article instigated by Mrs. Catt. It's just as well, she added, Mrs. Stevens is considered so strongly anti that she did not have the courage to openly proclaim her change to suffrage. She's much too influenced by politicians who are averse to suffrage instead of holding their own opinions and converting the politicians. Mrs. Chrysler of Jackson, Thompson continued, has accepted the chairmanship temporarily. Although a recent convert to suffrage, she is heart and soul with the policy of the NWP. You and she, that's uh, Mrs. Crump of Nita Yuma, are all the state needs for the present, although the Gulfport women and the vice chairman at Long Beach are standing pat for the NWP. On June the 18th, the Vicksburg Post revealed the problem. Ms. Cherry Bomer, the membership chair of the Vicksburg 
NWP committee said that local women were interested in suffrage and ardently hoped for it, but many are unwilling to take a definite stand. I believe they are afraid of their husbands, she said. During early July, Thompson was campaigning on the Gulf Coast again. Then, on July the 27th, the Natchez Democrat reported that the NWP had established a state headquarters during a Natchez Hotel convention. The report includes the committee names, women from Gulf Coast Times, Natchez, Jackson and Vicksburg. Now then, WP activity in Mississippi fades, but as the DC campaign became more intense with the imprisonment and torture of Alice Paul in November, the NWP returned south with, Jack with Jackson and Vicksburg, part of the tour. And Mabel Vernon on there, she was one of the first suffragists to be arrested. After this, the NWP's Mississippi activity seemed to end, at least in the newspaper reports, but the campaign achieved a lot. While failing to persuade Harrison or any Mississippi representative to vote either for suffrage or for ratification, it added pressure to Wilson, pushing him further towards suffrage if only for his own political ends. It also raised the NWP profile in Mississippi, and the November tour informed the nation of the torture of suffragists in prison, bypassing press suppression of the news. And if you want to see the tube that they used for force feeding, I have a sample of it here, plus the kind of clothes that they were forced, forced to wear during the summer in prison. Now, Mississippi helped in all this important work. Their short tale has further significance. It demonstrates that history repeats itself. Media vilification of signatories of the 1840 Media vilification of signatories of the 1848 Declaration of Sentiments led to the withdrawal of many of them, and a similar outcry worked here. But history repeating itself rests in more than the details. When I proposed this talk, I never dreamt of the circumstances I might be delivering it in. A time when citizens again would be living under an administration holding and torturing political prisoners, with censorship awash throughout the nation, with a war in Europe, plus a dictator in Canada. This is not the more things change, the more they stay the same. Unfortunately, it's much worse. History does repeat, but it's not necessarily progressive. And in this case, it's regressive. And it's time we change the course of history. Thank you, Ms. Cahill. I will have a moment at the end of all the presentations for some questions. Our second presenter is Bo Bowen, who will be discussing Fred Clark Cheney, Hotting Carter Jr. in the Whitfield Editorials. Mr. Bowen has over 40 years of healthcare experience, retiring as the Vice President of Quality Improvement at, at Information and Quality Healthcare, and as the Deputy Administrator with the Mississippi Division of Medicaid. He received a Bachelor's of Science degree from Mississippi State University, and as a retired licensed social worker. He began his healthcare career as an attendant at Mississippi State Hospital, Whitfield, Mississippi, working on the maximum security building for the criminally insane and on the mail receiving service. What began as a college part-time job, uh, he remained at for a year and a half. He returned to college graduating with a BS in educational psychology. Immediately after graduation in 1972, he was employed at Mississippi State Hospital as a licensed social worker until 1978. During his employment, he gained experience working with mental patients, psychiatrists, nurses, the administration, and his fellow social workers. This experience provided him with the expertise to understand the culture and history of institutionalization and deinstitutionalization, and describing it from both the patient's historical account and from his own personal involvement in the treatment of the mentally ill. In 1978, he was employed by the Office of the Governor, Division of Medicaid, and after 25 years, retired as a Deputy Administrator of Health Services. He conducted independent assessments of nursing facilities and later developed and implemented home and community-based services, waivers, which provided services for individuals at home rather than in a care nursing facility. He was instrumental in the development of the Long-Term Care Alternatives Program, Primary Case Care Management, 
program and a development of a fully uh, capitated voluntary HMO program. After retiring from the state in 2003, he was employed at Information and Quality Healthcare, a Medicare quality improvement organization, serving as Vice President of Corporate Services and Quality Improvement Programs for hospitals, physicians' offices, and nursing facilities, retiring in 2012. Please welcome Mr. Bowen. My mother, God love her, would have been so happy to know that I'm a scholar. <laughs> you may have heard of Hottie Carter Jr. and you may have heard of Mississippi State Hospital at Whitfield, but you probably have never heard of Fred Clark Cheney, except for maybe a few people in here. Fred Cheney was born on Christmas Day, 1904. He was the great grandson of Civil War Governor Charles Clark. I don't have a presentation. Okay. Uh, he said he was the great grandson of Civil War Governor Charles Clark. He was a cousin to Walter Sillers Jr., who was the longtime Speaker of the House of Representatives, and he was a friend of Delta Democrat Times editor Hiding Carter Jr. in Greenville. Cheney was a man of vision, a lawyer, a prolific writer, and a crusader who spent the greater part of his life at Mississippi State Hospital, and from his first admission at age 22 to St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C. in 1926, and then to the Mississippi Insane Asylum in 1932, and then to Mississippi State Hospital in 1939. He, he had numerous admissions, elopements, which means escapes, paroles and discharges had been made with his home until his death in 1975. Um, he carried with him over the years a multitude of diagnoses, beginning with, and remember this is starting back in 1926, dementia precox, constitutional psychopathic irresponsible, not psychotic, psychosis due to glandular disorder, manic depressive, schizophrenia, paranoid type, psychopathic personality and psychosis with cerebral arteriosclerosis. Fred Cheney knew all of these diagnoses, but he described himself only as mean as hell. <laughs> Hottie Carter Jr., native of Louisiana, was the editor and publisher of the Delta Democrat Times. He won the Pulitzer Prize in 1946 for his editorials on the intolerance of the Japanese immigrants and also his attacks on racist Senator Theodore G. Bill. His stance on discrimination and voters' rights and, uh, was not popular in the Mississippi Delta, as you could imagine. He fought against the White Citizens Council, formed to preserve segregation in the Delta. Um, he was censured by the Mississippi House of Representatives, and he fired back with an editorial beginning, I hereby resolve by a vote of one to nothing that there are 89 liars in the state legislature. <laughs> Hiding Carter III, his son, said that his father was a lonely white voice in opposition to Mississippi's segregationist forces. He kept an arsenal of guns to defend himself and rallied his family to have vigil and to maintain arms at his Greenville home during the 1962 fight over integration at the University of Mississippi. Carter died in 1975, 1972 at 65 years of age. Fred Cheney's relationship with Hiding Carter began around 1939 when he stormed into the Delta Democrat Times office, brandishing a gun, threatening to kill Hiding Carter because Carter had written an editorial about his father, Rife Cheney, who was at that time was a sheriff of Washington County. It appears that that his that uh, Cheney had would not tell Carter about some of the things that he was planning to do, like shutting down the bars and the duke joints, and also about an incident that happened outside of uh, Greenville. And because he wouldn't do that, Carter wrote the editorial saying that he should resign. That's what charged Fred Cheney to go in there with a gun to threaten. Uh, they did resolve their, their problems and resolve their issues. They ended up becoming friends, and of course with the 
idea that Fred Cheney could have been arrested for threatening high employment. Um, you'll find, my wife will find this interesting too, is that my notes have all been scratched. I use a purple pen so I can see what I've done and what I've taken out. So I try to keep this down to the 15 to 17 minute mark. So bear with me. I learned of Fred Cheney while I was employed at the state hospital as an institutional social worker. He was a patient on one of my assigned cottages and he was bedridden during that time. It was more like an infirmary or a nursing home where he was. And the only thing he ever requested from me was to bring him a cigar so he could chew on it. That was it. The, the nurse on the building, the charge nurse on the building said, do you know who he is? I said, oh, then he's Fred Cheney. I don't know anything about him. He said, well, he's called the King of Whitfield, which is the biography I've written about. Um, and she said that if I want to know more about his life, I need to go to archives and history and pull his file and read, see what he had submitted to archives. Little did I know that over 45 years ago, I read with amazement this story about Fred Cheney, who requested that his story be told. Cheney was known to some as the King of Whitfield because it, of a special chair that was built for him. It was more like a throne. He was, and sometimes he was over 450 pounds. He was six foot two. The chair had a back on it that was at least five feet in the back, and the armrests were two by sixes. So he, the, the chair would be inside of his building when he was able to be in an unlocked building, and they would move it out when the weather was nice, and he would sit there and on his throne and there would be two smaller chairs on each side, and that would be for the other patients who would run errands for him. And um, you know, he would say, go to the store and buy me a cup of coffee, or bring me a cigar, go get me a Coke. And they did that. I mean, he had some money, he paid them. But there was one, one patient that had ground privileges and also had um, authority to ride the bus into Jackson. Believe it or not, during that time, back in the 40s, patients could go into Jackson on the, on the Whitfield bus and come back in. Well, his, his friend lost his privileges when they found out that he was bringing back six packs of beer for change. <laughs> so he lost his privileges. Fred Chain warned the story of his mental illness and his hospitalization Whitfield told anyone who would listen, and they did. He brought to light the squalid conditions at Whitfield and with most of his letter writing in the late 1940s and 1950s. He smuggled letters out of the hospital about the quality of food, the, the lack of food, living conditions, problems with hospital administration, the employees, political interference, patient rights, and at one time he just named Whitfield as the Red Brick Cemetery. Hiding Carter took a great interest in Cheney's insightful letters and published his correspondence. His editorials about Cheney and Whitfield brought about numerous investigations from the legislature, uh, the Mississippi Medical Association, and the Legislative Audit Committee, which ended up being called the Peer Committee. It was through these letters and manuscripts that he not only told the problems of Whitfield, but his recommendations to make changes. Um, the Delta Democrat Times, the Clarion Ledger, the Tupelo Daily Journal, and the Cone Enterprises Enterprise routinely had editorials and articles about Whitfield, especially when they were short of funding, and also about Cheney's recommendations. At first, Fred Cheney would end his letters as anonymous. Then he would say, a patient at Whitfield. And then he got bold and started signing his letters, Fred Cheney, patient at Whitfield. And this was back in the late 40s. Many times he was caught and punished for violating the censorship rules by trying to smuggle letters out of the hospital that had not been reviewed. Uh, he would be transferred to the white male disturbed building where he would be locked up he would receive tight packs, he'd be wrapped in wet sheets, cold packs, and hydrotherapy. He also received treatment in 
what was called an electric light cabinet bath for 10 minutes a day for weeks at a time. All letters coming in and out of the hospital had to be reviewed. Um, they had to be read by the staff. They would look for complaints, they would look for gossip, anything about life at Whitfield. If there was something that was derogatory about the hospital, the letters would be trashed. The way he got around this, not always got around with it, but he would smuggle letters out and give them to patients who were being discharged. So if he knew that a patient was going to be discharged, he already had a stack of letters that were going to go out. He'd give them to the patient, the patient would then, when they were discharged, he go and mail them. Another way he did it was, now, like I said, he was a prolific writer. He, wrote, he had a number of manuscripts that he wrote while he was there. Uh, there's one about the Mississippi River Flood of 1927, which is actually a really interesting manuscript. But because it didn't arouse suspicion, because it was about the flood, he would put his letters inside the manuscript that would go out to his mother. His mother would then take those letters, give them to Hottie Carter, Carter would publish them. Um, In those letters, he did talk about his observation of cruelty to patients, patients dying of starvation, tight packs in the disturbed building. Uh, needless to say, Hottie Carter published these letters verbatim. He didn't change them. He put them in exactly as Fred Cheney had written. Dr. William Jacobs, the longtime director of the state hospital, told the Greenville Lions Club in 1947 that it was Hiding Carter through these editorials that brought about change and also uh, the expose of the, of the practices that the hospital was practicing. And it was also a man from Washington County who was a patient at Whitfield who brought these conditions to life to, uh, to Hiding Carter. Uh, in 1949, there was an editorial in the Delta Democrat Times, Hiding Carter had said that the hospital was Mississippi's snake pit. He said, we have good personal reason for believing that all is not sweetness and light at Whitfield. Unlike patients in ordinary hospitals, the patients at Whitfield cannot command an audience when they have something to say. Many of them are sound enough in mind to tell stories that should be heard. During this time, Representative Hayden Campbell from Hines County, who was a member of the House of Representatives, did a one-man, two-month investigation at Whitfield. He would go out there during the night. He'd go during the day. He would slip in. He would go and see what was going on at the hospital. But he also knew Fred Cheney. So he and Fred Cheney talked about the conditions at the hospital, what was going on, and, and Cheney told him that that prior to Representative Campbell coming to his building, that the staff got all the rubber hoses that they used to beating on the, the feet of the patients when they were disturbed. They locked them away so that he wouldn't see them. And they did do that. They had rubber hoses that they would use for a disturbed patient to try to calm them down. Um, the Legislative Audit Committee which was later, like I said, known as the Peer Committee. They came out there and they did investigation based off what Representative Campbell had been saying and went, and this is not that big a deal, everything is fine out there, even though Representative Campbell had said that there was some of the cottages didn't have beds. Patients were sleeping on the bare floor. The uh, investigation committee's report said, with the exception of a few isolated cases, patients at the hospital have been and are receiving good treatment, and the hospital is properly managed and run in an orderly manner. Hiding Carter wrote an editorial and said he found that the report was another legislative whitewash. On January the 29th, 1949, Hiding Carter published Fred Cheney's recommendations to improve Whitfield in view of all the investigations that had already taken place. He said, Fred Cheney, the son of R.P. Cheney and the late Sheriff Cheney, has been at Whitfield for a number of years. During much of this time, we have kept up a correspondence with him and have on occasion talked with him of his life at Whitfield. 
As his Washington County friends know, Fred has unusual analytical ability and a power of expression that would have made an unusual newspaper man out of him. Because of the present discussion of conditions at the institution, we are outlining some of his observations and constructive suggestions with his mother's permission and with the conviction that the Whitfield authorities will recognize the validity of his proposals and his right to express them. The first recommendation was change the admittance laws so that it won't be easy to slip people in and forget them. I'm sure everyone has heard of people that would be brought to the hospital by their families. If they were drunk at night, whatever, they bring them to the hospital, they'll have them admitted. If you were acting up or something was going wrong in your family, you take them to Whitfield and they would bring them in. So the admission laws needed to be changed. Guarantee that all patients on the chronic services, except for the congenital idiots, a staffing and general examination by all staff members at least once a year, to check up on their condition and possible eligibility for parole. All patients should have a staffing of more than just the one physician, a staffing of doctors who would talk to the patient and decide whether or not they could be released or if they were, you know, in the condition where they could go to family or whatever. Uh, but they weren't doing that. See that medical inspections and all chronic services carried out at least four times a week, if not daily instead of once a month or once every 60 days. There were patients who were never even seen for like 60 days. They were just there. Um, to discourage the abuse and mistreatment that lack of adequate inspection makes possible that so often has occurred undetected upon the chronic wards. Fourth is, see that all confined patients are taken off the stone floors and out of their cramped locked wards for fresh air sunshine and exercise for at least two or three hours each day that weather conditions will permit. This period on the outside for a breather will mean much even to the most of the patients who have no possibility for recovery. It should be provided for all confined patients here even if a wire enclosure has to be built to serve a sort of exercise yard from which they cannot escape. Try to improve the diet and guarantee a little variety in the diet served chronic ward patients. It is certainly too monotonous, unvaried, and coarse now to really build the patients towards health and a fair chance for recovery. In another uh, manuscript he had written, Chaney had written, he said, when I first came there, I saw men and women starving to death on the rations of yellow mush and wheat shorts. How many died of starvation under that unspeakable, inhuman administration, no one will ever know. They called it death from natural causes. Dr. Jacobs joined the Whitfield staff, medical staff in 1947. And he found when he first came out there, the conditions were so appalling and the care of the patients so poor, he was sick. He said that he was here six weeks before he seeing meat of any sort served and when it was finally served, it was in the form of small lumps of salt pork. The black-eyed peas were full of weevils. Cheney said that the two things you never heard at Woodfield was a kind word and meat or fun. Another recommendation is try another basic system of pay that would seek to introduce the principle of tying together the advantage of the chronic ward staff with the patients. In other words, if the staff can help in the recovery of a patient and get them out of the hospital, then they should be rewarded in, in addition to their pay for being able to help with their recovery. Another is a uh, campaign should be started to abolish the tight rooms where patients are sometimes put. A tight room would be a place that would be, how am I on time? Okay, I'll talk faster. Um, Anyway, to, do, to get rid of the, the tight rooms, and I want to say that in a 1975 lawsuit, the building that he had been locked up on for many years, the suit claimed that the building had mold and mildew from leaky ceilings, patients' mail was censored, patients had no magazine, books, or opportunity for recreational activities, and they said the inmates are not aware of the weather or the season. 
It took 26 years after his recommendation before a lawsuit was finally filed to close that building. Um, the editorial continued and said that we're hoping that this was in the interest of the patients at Whitfield and that nothing will happen to Fred Chain because of this. They said, we believe that the response will be favorable to the editorial, and this went all over the state. Newspapers picked up on the editorials, and it became an outcry. And they also said in the editorial, it's unthinkable that any official or employee with Phil should take it out on Fred for making a worthwhile contribution to an understanding of the needs and shortcomings of the patient. God help the soul of a man who would be small enough to retaliate. They did. Two weeks after the editorial ran, Cheney was met with a staff of physicians and the superintendent of the hospital, and they said that he could be moved from the disturbed building only if he signed the form. And basically saying is that he would completely refrain from writing letters to be mailed out sent out of the institution uncensored and agreed to make no effort to have letters sent out of the institution without first having them properly censored and that he would lose his ground privilege if he was but so they were saying mm -mm, you can't do this anymore no more letters you're going to sign this form and they did he signed the form and he said that no more could anyone of the outsiders know about his ideas um, I'm hurrying. Uh, Cheney wrote lengthy epistles and manuscripts and letters. Some of these would, let, would be at least 90 pages long. Yes, he was psychotic to a certain extent. But he would write letters that would be 90 pages long. Uh, but he, some of his proposals, one was a work for pay, patients work for pay plan. Patients that were out at the hospital provided free labor to the hospital. They worked in the dairies, they worked on the farm, they worked in the, the laundry, they worked in the workshops. And all of this, they worked because it was good for them. Work is a bane and cure for mental ills. So they said it was therapeutic. Well, what Cheney was saying was, okay, but you need to pay them for the work that they're doing out there. That was his recommendation. He also proposed this same patient work for pay plan to the superintendent of Parchment. He said they should be doing the same thing. If there's a, an inmate at the, at the at Parchment who are working the same things that they were doing out at Whitfield, farm, dairy, uh, laundries, all these other things, that they should be paid too. But what they should do with the money is that some of the money should be set aside for the inmate's dependents or for the victim of that crime. Um, he also had another work program of, of developing a garment, two minutes, of a garment plan to supply the institution pants, shirts, and dresses. This was like vocation rehab. And they did, at some point, develop a garment plan out there. Um, let's skip here. The impact of Cheney's observations as a patient at the State Hospital and the changes he recommended to anyone who would listen served as a litmus test to the current treatment of mental illness in Mississippi. His manuscript, Mental Hospitalization in Mississippi is known to a patient, was sent to Charlotte Capers at the Department of Archives and History with a letter requesting that it be held to check by its date against the future course of mental hospitalization as it develops, not in vision, but in fact. He also wrote a letter to his mother in 1957, said perhaps these things will lie a long time in the archives, without much interest or particular worth to anyone. Perhaps they will in the future be much used as more and more for public interest of all kinds centers upon the problem of mental health mental hospitalization in Mississippi, at any rate, they will be publicly available. Thank you, Mr. Bowen. Our final presenter today is Jessica O'Connor, whose topic is exploring the influence and importance of middle-class black women in Mississippi. Ms. O'Connor began her career as a researcher 
undergrad as an undergrad at the illustrious Winston-Salem State University. There she studied 19th and 20th century Pan-African history, focusing on the intersection of gender and politics in civil rights work through primary and archival materials. In 2017, she completed her graduate work at the University of North Carolina at Greensboro, where she earned her MA in Museum Studies. There she blended her historical research with public history, making digital exhibitions and black history collections accessibility the central focus of her thesis work. Now she serves as the exhibit's content specialist at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, where she aids in exhibition development to tell Mississippi's many stories. In addition to her work, she serves as the Social Justice Committee Chair and board member for the Small Museum Association and president of the Mississippi chapter of the National Emerging Museum Professionals Network. Please welcome Ms. O'Connor. Thank you for that introduction. I don't know who wrote it, but she did a great job. <laughs> Uh, this morning I'm going to take you down an incongruous crossroads. Uh, we're going to talk about black women, the middle class, and the women's era. Before we do that, I'd like to make a land acknowledgement for us today. This presentation is being given here in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, a land that rightfully belongs to the Choctaw and Chickasaw people. We acknowledge that the land on which we live and work is marked by a long history of systemic inequities, including forced removal, exclusions, and erasures. If y'all are not from Mississippi, I am not a Mississippian, nor am I a native Hattiesburg uh, resident. Um, I highly recommend you check out the link on the slide, that's native-land.ca, that will tell you about the treaties, the peoples, on the different lands that we live in in the United States and in North America. So today we're going to be talking about the woman's era in three parts. And these three parts are going to start with couple of different options. We have temperance and prohibition. So we have work that's coming out of the post-reconstruction era. Can y'all hear me? <laughs> yeah, better now. Yeah, please speak into the mic. better? I'm getting nods. It sounds like that's a good sign. Okay. The back says it's great. All right. Uh, so what we're looking at here is we're going to be looking at temperance and prohibition, domestic protections, as well as the enfranchisement and social equity movements that are going to start uh, as we enter into the late 19th and early 20th centuries. But before we do that, I want to introduce you to a character that we won't have a lot of time to get into today, but Josephine Yates is the second president of the National Association of Colored Women. She's got a really interesting backstory. She's our second president of the organization. She's the daughter of a freedman in Rhode Island. She has a lot of education under her belt. She gets her master's degree in chemistry. Uh, she's the first black woman in the United States to have a full professor professorship at a university in Nebraska. And she starts to employ the women of the National Association of Colored Women. This will become the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs later. That organization is the first step in nation making, and that nation can rise in the scale no higher than its womanhood. That was which are principles that we have come to look upon by sociologists and all students of the development of humanity as self-evident truth. So she's placing women at the center of nation-making here and that if all women are not equal, if they are not equal to men and equal to each other, we cannot grow as a nation. And so what I would like to start with, if y'all would indulge me, is a little nation-making of our own. So if you would all mind, if you are able to and comfortable with standing for just a minute, if you would all please rise. Sorry for the live streamers, also please rise if you'd like to. And for the next few slides, I would just like you to stand until you some see something or someone or an organization that you no longer recognize. So if you recognize them all, you're still going to be standing. As soon as you see something that's brand new, please sit. So first we're going to open with The Slaveholder's Daughter, a monograph written by Belle Carney. Moving into a red. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, the Red Record by Ida B. Wells. It's the follow up to Southern Horse. You'll also see Miss Wells here. We have Mitty Giddings Cox of Indianola, National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, and their motto is Lifting as We Climb, the Women's Christian Temperance Union or known as the WCTU, that's the Greenville chapter. Ms. Frances Willard, 
Nellie Newton Somerville, Mary Bell Carney, and the Mississippi Women's Suffrage Association. And before we head into our next slide, if you would like to see our self-evident truths here in the room today, just take a quick glance around the room to see how many people are still standing. We've got some work to do today. I like it. All right. I won't make you stand anymore, but you all can go ahead and sit down. So we open with the post-reconstruction realities of temperance and prohibition. Now, as we know, during the Civil War, white women are implored to do more than they have been tasked with quite literally ever before. As men are not returning from the war, they're being tasked with holding down their farmlands, their homes, they're taking jobs. Carrie Bell Carney will also have to do this. Um, we see a resurgence with the second great awakening of more women in the church frankly because that's where they have the most freedom and they have the opportunity to vote on church matters. The Second Great Awakening is also going to introduce us to temperance, which is a movement that starts in 1870 and will come to the South about a decade later. And during the Second Great Awakening is where we start to see a divide in black and white organizing, and it starts at the pulpit. White preachers are imploring their congregations to be temperate, to focus on temperance, to be pious, good, moral people, that's going to get you into heaven. But if you don't do that and also bring somebody with you, you don't get to go. Right? It's a buy one, get one free deal for some of these organizations. But the black pulpit is doing something very different. This is a rise in the era of Mississippi lynchings. They're imploring people to stay temperate, to stay sober, to be good, moral people, not so that they can make it into heaven, although that is an additional goal, but so that they can make it home to their families at the end of the night. So we see this split in motivation very quickly between organizations that are started by middle class women. What it also does is open us up to the uh, first issue that we're going to see between organizers, and that's going to come between Ida B. Wells and Frances Willard. Now at this time, in about the late 1890s, uh, Ida B. Wells is already very well known, we know this. She's a published author, she's just put out a Southern Horror, Lynch Laws in All Its Phases. She's active in the Mississippi uh, organizing community. Uh, the Memphis Free Press office has also just burned down, and she's been run out of town and is effectively a little bit homeless right now, so she's going on a speaking tour. Um, and here she's starting to gather statistics for the Red Record, which is lynching in the United States, and it's all statistical-based. So this is going to be something that Congress is not going to be able to ignore because it's facts and figures that they can't whitewash. Now, at the same time, the United States is introduced to a woman named Frances Willard, and as you can see in this picture, she kind of looks like the inspiration for the Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> it's fine. Uh, but she is the second uh, president of the Women's Christian Temperance Union at the national level, and she pushes a concept called Agitate, Educate, Legislate. And she agitates just about anybody she comes into contact with because she wants more legislation and more educational opportunities. Uh, so while Ida B. Wells is on her national speaking tour, she's making these incredible conversations happen about lynching, the realities of Mississippi, and for black people. Frances Willard has learned how to ride a bike. And then she wrote a book about it. And that has given her enough power to go a little bit further in what she's asking for the WCTU to do, because they're entering more into the public sphere. Now, as she does this, she starts to use language that wouldn't typically be recognized by the WCTU because it is flashy and it is quite a bit more direct than they would like for their membership to do. And she begins to fall out of favor with her organization. And we're going to look at a comparison uh, here in just this next slide. Um, in 1890, Frances Willard writes to the New York Voice that says that black voters were the great dark-faced mobs whose rallying cry is better whiskey and more of it. The grog shop is the center of power. The safety of women, of childhood, of the home is menaced in a thousand localities at this moment. So that men dare go beyond the side of their own, board, of their own roof tree. Now, as I've already mentioned, Ida B. Wells is on a speaking tour. She's trying to save people uh, from being victims of lynchings. And then she gets a hold of this conversation in 1892. And if you know Ida B. Wells, the, thing that I, the way I think this group knows Ida B. Wells, you know she's got plots. So she writes to the AME Church and says that Miss Frances E. Willard, president of the National Women's Christian Temperance Union, lately told the world that the center of power of the race is the saloon. 
that white men for this reason are afraid to leave their homes, that the Negro in late prohibition campaign sold his vote for 25 cents, etc. Ms. Willard's statements possess a small pro rata of truth of all sweeping statements, but every reader of these lines who loves their race and feels the force of these, sentence, of these statements can make himself a committee of one to influence someone else. So too, an organized combination of all these agencies for humanity's good will sweep the country with a wave of public sentiment which shall make liquor traffic unprofitable and dishonorable and remove one of the principal stumbling blocks to race progress. And so temperance very quickly becomes the point of contention between rising organizations organized by black women. As it becomes publicly clear that organizations like the WCTU and the National American Women Suffrage Association are not going to align with black women on the importance of having suffrage for all and protections in the home, we're going to start to split and we'll see organizations emerge like the National Association of Colored Women and the NAACP in 1909. Now I have two versions of this next slide, and so you all are just going to have to indulge me in one more survey. Uh, because this one does have some triggering content. I do have uh, the, the same slide as the next slide. So the show of hands, if you all are okay with seeing the moments just before a lynching, I'm just going to give you a quick hand. Okay, I'm say majority of here. And so we enter into the world of domestic protections. Now, for women like Nellie Nugent Somerville, this is going to mean an end to child labor and raising the, and raising the age of consent from 10 to 16. For Carrie Bell Carney, this is going to raise a new set of questions that's going to heavily depend on who she's talking to at the time. And this is where she begins to make a lot of enemies. And this is where we see a very clear divide in what will become the second wave of the civil rights movement and the first wave of feminism. But it also introduces us to boxing match number three. It's Carrie Bell Carney versus Nellie Nugent Somerville versus a little bit of everybody else and Minnie Giddings Cox. Now, as I mentioned before, Carrie Bell Carney is not a very well-liked individual. She's mean, she's pushy, she has the nerve to ask for a paycheck for her public speaking engagements. Yeah, I know. <laughs> right. Um, and so there's this back and forth between Carrie Bell Carney and Nellie Nugent Somerville about what to do with the women's, women's associations in Mississippi and nationally. Uh, at the same time that Mitty Giddings Cox is having her own war in Indianola. Um, we don't have a lot of time to get into the Indianola affair today, uh, but she's Mississippi's first black postmistress. Uh, she's forced out of that role uh, due to some choice words from James K. Vardaman. Um, and she returns a year later, and she opens the Delta Penny Savings Bank and the Mississippi Life Insurance Company, which is offering opportunities for black people to have somewhere to safely put their money and to be offered whole life insurance policies at premiums that are not exploitative of the workers that need those policies to protect their families. So she begins to do the work that the women's organizations are not doing. They're not working to protect black homes. They're only working to protect middle and wealthy white women. It's also not going to include poor and immigrant women that are coming from Europe at the same time. And so we get into it with some words here, and Carrie Bill Carney is known to be very flowery, and I guess you have to if you're getting paid by the words and making enemies as you go along. But she's very clear in her motivations as she becomes the president of the Mississippi Women's Suffrage Association. She says the enfranchisement of women would ensure immediate and durable white supremacy. Honestly attained, for upon unquestionable authority, it is stated that in every state, southern state but one, there are more educated women than all of the illiterate voters, white and black, native and foreign combined. As you probably know, all of the women in the South who can read and write, 10 out of every 11 are white. When it comes to the proportion of the property between the races, that of the white outweighs that of the black immeasurably. The South is slow to grasp the great fact that the enfranchisement of women would settle the race question in politics. Y'all can probably guess that she's a big believer in the lost cause. Uh, but her mortal enemy, Nellie Nugent Somerville, who finds her to be much of a nuisance and kind of a pain in the neck most of the time, uh, is not one to mince words. She and Ida B. Wells have this in common pretty easily. In uh, 1909, she's asked by a member of the National Women's Suffrage Association from Virginia, if we give suffrage to all women, what will we do about black women? And she's very clear as she dodges the question for a while, but she gets cornered at this conference. She says very plainly, how would women's suffrage apply to the American Negress the same way it applies to the American Negro? Uh, 
So as we see that it's very clear that these women's organizations are continuing to disalign with the work that the civil rights uh, leaders are doing during this time, we'll see a resurgence of new organizations led by black middle class women. And this raises more conversations about enfranchisement and social equity. Who's getting the vote? What does that mean for body politics? We're going to see that coming up in the media a lot more frequently. Uh, this will introduce us to two concepts titled the New Women and the New Negro, which will emerge after World War I. And it will introduce us also to first wave feminism. And so as we get into our final battle of this boxing match here, we're going to see Mississippi versus Mississippi. Uh, on the left here, you see that a Mississippi legislator is uh, dangling suffrage rights in front of a white woman because they had to politically align themselves with the anti-saloon league during the temperance movement. And those men promised that if you help us get prohibition in Mississippi, we'll help you get the vote. And then they said, just kidding. We don't actually want you to vote. And they're not going to ratify the 19th Amendment until 1984. But the rhetoric that they're using against white women is the same tactics that white women are using against black women and that we are only asking for white women to be able to vote to maintain the system of white supremacy coming out of the post-reconstruction era. And what we see here is also a growth of body politics. So we're going to see things like the Gibson girl uh, versus, uh, versus more traditional 19th century, very tight, very uplaced kind of um, heavy fabrics, those kinds of things. We don't have time to get into the backstories of all these women, and I wish we could, but I'm using them as an example here of the kind of visuals you'll see in the change of time as we move from the early 1900s into the 1920s. So on the far right in the center, on the left-hand side of that image is Nellie Nugent Somerville, about 1888, next to that woman to the left is her sister. The woman above her standing is her sister-in-law. Next to her is Pauline Vandegraaff Orr, uh, who works for the Mississippi University for Women, She's got her own suffrage story. She's a really interesting character. Um, coming towards me to the left is Fanny Labor. Uh, she's very prominent in Natchez. And then we have a number of people represented here uh, from Jackson State College. Now, two of these women would be considered, quote unquote, respectable radicals. I think you can guess who those two women would be. And they're that way. These other two women are going to start to fall under categories of things that you're going to see applied a lot in the newspapers you see through about the 1950s and 60s. And these women, if they're in the public eye, they're doing this work, are going to be considered fast and loose. Even though, as you can clearly see, they are dressed the same, they are doing the same amount of work, and they are actively engaged in the same ways. And this will effectively usher in a new era of organizing. We have the new woman versus the new Negro, which comes after World War I. Now, the new woman is the Gibson girl, your flappers. There's all of those images we have traditionally of the 1920s. The new Negro is going to come through the Harlem Renaissance following World War I as soldiers are returning to the United States. That's where we see Madam C.J. Walker really see her rise. She's a very prominent figure. Uh, we see more women in publications, though they are mirroring the Gibson girl, they're doing it in a very different way so that they can separate themselves from white organizers. This is also going to start into a divide within the organizations themselves. These women who want to work within the system and break the barriers internally are now being met by people who have seen the world. They're coming back from World War I and they want more. They want to dismantle these systems of white supremacy very directly and very clearly. As a result, we're going to see in the 1920s the first wave of feminism. That's going to look very different for different women of different groups within the organizations, especially as Garveyism hits the United States. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to get into the first wave feminism today, but if you're interested in the, all of the materials that I use for this presentation and for the paper, you can hit that QR code. That'll take you to a Google Drive with all of my references, and I appreciate y'all's time. So, uh, when he signs the document that he can get out of the locked room, you say he did not write any more letters after that? No, he should have. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> he still did. He didn't keep his word out. Oh, uh, no, no. But he no. didn't get punished for going back to it. Yeah. He would always do that. <laughs> yeah. He would, he would do something to try to escape. He would, you know, make a rock or something on campus and they're sitting back. Mm -hmm.
be able to get out. A lot of people did get out. He he ended up saying that Whitfield was his home. He had spent so much time in there, and his family would not take care of him. They said he was too vile. You know, he caused problems in Greenville. They put him in jail. He got drunk. He was taking drugs, acting suspicious, and they would send him back to Whitfield. He did stay out of the hospital for about five years and actually had an apartment in Jackson. So, you know, he was able to get out, but he also had some other issues too. I just have a comment that I cannot believe that Mr. Peter is not here and Nitty Yuma was pitching. <laughs> More than anything, with Mr. Beer is from New Yuma, and there would not be a meeting ever of this Charlotte Society without him mentioning this hometown of New Yuma. And I hope he knows about this problem. I bet he does. I hope he sure does. There's an article in the Dallas Magazine last year. It's about New Yuma. They can complete that photograph, which is according to the library of Congress references that the name is mixed up. Um, when both of y'all were talking about voting and uh, the rights of women, there was a, a lady by the name of Minnie Brewer. You know the name? She was the, the daughter of Governor Earl of Whitman. And she spent 40 years of her life, continuous 40 years, in the state hospital. Her doctor, who I knew I used to work with, she had a special cottage that she lived in. She was a friend of, of course, uh, Somerville. And, uh, she wrote The Woman Voter, a little newspaper in Clarksdale. You know that? So it's, it was the, the newspaper of the League of Women Voters, um, brand new League of Women Voters, and her mom was also the president of the Mississippi State League of Women Voters. Yeah. The, the only interesting thing was that the doctor that treated her, she would never talk to her. She would never say a word to her. Well, if you remember, years ago, there was an article in the Clarion Ledger. It was about children of governors who signed their name up in the act of the governor's name. And he just asked her, said, did you ever sign your name you know, in the act? And the first time she'd ever spoke to him, she said yes. So somewhere up in the attic, in the governor's mansion, many rules were signed in the way. Right. Do we have any other questions? All right, well, I'd like to thank all of our presenters and guests. An extra special thanks from the Mississippi Historical Society to Ms. LaToya Norman for suggesting this beautiful meeting space and the historic uh, Eucra, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> the historic Eureka School Museum. Uh, according to our uh, schedule today, uh, we have a short break and our next session will resume in this room at 10.30. Thank you all.